All right, welcome to the first episode of Catholic Scripture Twisters. And in this episode, I want to get into a bunch of the scriptures that they actually twist, but briefly, because this is an introduction to the series. So I'm going to get into a few examples of what they twist. And in other episodes, I'll get into these topics in more detail and probably other topics because they twist the scriptures all over the place. But these are the main ones, and these are the ones I've been talking to Catholics about recently. So this is what I'm going to focus on. But before I do, there's a couple of disclaimers. There's rules to reading and understanding the Bible. The first thing is, is that it's about reading comprehension, not interpretation. You don't have to go to any book you read and have an interpreter for it. You need reading comprehension to be able to understand what you're reading. Right? So when the Catholic says, oh, that's your interpretation, you're interpreting wrong, you need to go to the church for interpretation. you got to go to the early church fathers. Well, then you can say, well, how come I don't need an interpretation for the early church fathers of the church? You see how that quickly ends that argument right there. Because you don't. The problem is that they don't like what the scriptures say, clearly, plain as day, so they want to go to the early church fathers. But then you go, well, I need an interpreter for that. Uh, you don't need one. Well, why not? Well, because they say what they mean and mean what they say. God's word doesn't? You see, that's the first rule, is that the Bible says what it means and means what it says. Such as God saying, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God means what he says, says what he means. Simple as that. Don't eat from the tree. No ifs, ands, ors, or but. But then you want to go to the early church fathers. We've got, we've got Satan over here saying, hey, well, God did say you could eat from every tree of the garden, right? And then, you know, Eve, the woman representing a church there, you know, adding to the word saying, well, you can't even touch it. She added that you can't even touch it or you'll die. So now Satan just has to touch it and show, see, God's a liar. But God's not lying. What she said God said is a lie. You see, the, the twisting of the scriptures, interpreting it instead of taking it for what it says. Just like you listening to me now. Do you need an interpreter? No, you just take me for what I say. I say what I mean and mean what I say. You don't need some outside uh, force, some outside interpreter to tell you what's going on because then who interprets them and then who interprets them it just it never ends right you just keep going to an interpreter until they tell you what you want to hear they tell you what you want to believe but the truth is the truth and the truth is it says what it means it means what it says i'm saying that over and over to really drill it in to make that point that's the first rule right so when there's something in the Bible that you don't comprehend, you don't understand, that needs to be, quote-unquote, interpreted, you let the Bible interpret the Bible. Just like if you have a problem comprehending something I'm saying because you think that what I'm saying says sounds like I'm saying to go left, but it also sounds kind of like I'm saying to go right, so it's confusing to you. So you ask me to clarify, am I saying to go left or am I saying to go right? And you allow me to interpret myself and explain to you what I really mean because you're having a hard time comprehending and understanding what I'm saying. The same thing with the Bible. If you don't get what it's saying, you allow the Bible to interpret it. A good example would be Revelation chapter 17 where it talks about a woman who is a harlot sitting on a scarlet colored beast with seven heads and ten horns. You continue in the chapter, it starts to explain to you that the woman who sits upon the many waters, the waters are nations and tongues and languages and whatnot, that the the beast is kingdoms, the seven heads represent the kings, and the, these ten horns represent kings that haven't received kingdoms yet, and it gives you the great detail on this woman is a city. So it tells you what it means. You allow the Bible to interpret the Bible. You don't just go make up what what it means, right? You think it's a literal woman riding on a literal seven-headed beast going around uh, destroying the world like Godzilla. No, that's not what's going on. 
even though metaphorically that is what's going on. Uh, but anyway, so with that being said, the last thing I would like to say as a disclaimer is that if you read something in the Bible, then it says something where you like, hey, this this says a, a certain doctrine. I'm going to start teaching this. No one's been teaching this. But you can't find it anywhere else in the Bible. It's kaput. You are obviously misunderstanding and not comprehending what is being said. You see, that's why I have this up here. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every mouth may be established. Right? Every word may be established. My bad. And then over here. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the third time I am coming to you. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So you need at least two or three witnesses. This comes from the Torah. You can read this in the writings of Moses. There needs to be at least two or three witnesses to establish a fact. And that is giving homage to the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You need at least two to three to establish something. Right? So if you just find one, one passage where it seems to be saying something, but nowhere else in the Bible does it collaborate, you're obviously misunderstanding what's being said. Real simple, right? So the first thing I would like to get into is what I was talking to someone about with baptism, and this is what uh, the Catholic brought up. Now, talking about you need to be baptized in water, and that's the key, is water, in order to be saved and to receive the Holy Spirit. So he comes up over here in Titus chapter 3, and I have the strong concordance ready because of what he brought up. It says here, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. So here we see that we are washed, or baptized, by the Holy Ghost. Right? You see this word here is a washing, a bath, which also can be used for baptism. Right? So he says, yeah, see, it's washing, it's baptism. That means water. No, it doesn't, because you can be baptized in water. You can be baptized in fire. You can be baptized by the Holy Ghost. Right? All three of those are cleansing. So when it's saying that you're baptized or washed, it doesn't have to be by water. In this case, it's the Holy Ghost. He kept trying to say that it's water because he automatically associates washing and baptism with water. So water has to be part of this. No. You're adding to the word of God. you got to take it for what it says. You see the problem there? They're adding something that's not there. They're making an assumption. Right? So he goes, no, no, no. See, come over here. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26, it says that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Right? So you go, see, the washing with water. See, water. So he's associating it. But look at this. This is the water. The word that is from Titus chapter 3. A washing, a bath, also used for baptism. Water, a completely different word. This word is not in Titus chapter 3. So you see here the washing or the baptism is of water in this passage. This one doesn't have the word water. You see, we can receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, by our belief, we don't need to be water baptized. And I'll show you. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? 
So see, they've already received the Holy Ghost even before baptism, right? And Paul, I mean, Peter is preaching the gospel here, saying, whosoever believeth in him shall have remission of sins. So it's by your belief that your sins are washed away, you're saved. And they believe the words, receive the Holy Ghost, and then the baptism is an outward show of their faith. All right? As Paul says over here in Ephesians chapter 1, start this little section right here, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we see here that it's after you believe, not water baptized, that you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So when it says here, the washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, you don't have to put the word water in there because these people just believed and they received the Holy Ghost. You see, as it says here, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Again, refuting them, saying, see, it's not by your works, your righteous works, even of water baptism. It is by the Holy Ghost. You know, these phrases, these the passages that you bring up actually refruit Catholicism pretty bad. That it goes that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That would be the Bible. Right? So you go and get cleansed, you get into the word. It doesn't say by getting water baptized. Right? He's saying that the word of God baptizes you. Right? Well, you see here, they believe the gospel. They received the Holy Ghost. Then they are water baptized. Paul, you received the Holy Ghost, not when you were water baptized, but as soon as you believed. That's when you received it. But you go by the Catholics. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean what it says. It doesn't mean what it says there. It means something else. And then they twist it. You see, Jesus and the apostles are the early church fathers. And you, you see the little subtle trick they say is that, no, these people who came after, they're the early church fathers. Well, what about Jesus and the apostles? Who are they? It's like they completely dismiss them. It's a subtle little thing that psychologically, subconsciously, they basically push Jesus and the apostles aside while still giving them some praise, but focusing on what the early church father said. Now, like, we're going to believe these people. Let's follow these people. But it's where the, where's the interpreter of these people? You know what? If anything, we should be using the Bible to interpret the so-called early church fathers, not the early church fathers to interpret the Bible. It's like they assume that these people are the most holy people that ever lived. It's weird. But anyway, let's look at some more things that they twist. Let's continue with this baptism thing. Coming over here. In John chapter 3, Jesus starts talking to this man, Nicodemus, about the kingdom of God. And he says that he needs to be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answers, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So we see here, Jesus says that you need to be born again. And then over here it says he must be born of water and of the spirit. Jesus does not say here that you need to be born again, again. He doesn't say you need to be born into water, and then you need to be born again into the spirit. No, he's saying that you've already been born of the water. Now you need to be born of the spirit. As he continues here, the water represents the flesh, the water of your mother's womb. There's no mention of baptism here. It says that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So he's saying, yes, you've been born of the mother's, your mother's womb from water. That's your first birth. Your second birth is of the spirit when you believe. And that's what I'm going to show you what Jesus says. You're not born again by water baptism. There's no mention of water baptism and what Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about. 
right? Now I'm going to show you how Catholics will twist this up pretty bad, real bad, just by what I've been talking to these fellows about. But anyway, uh, so we see here you're born again, not you're born again by water, and that means water baptism, and then you're born again of the Spirit. No, no, no. You're completely misunderstanding. You lack reading comprehension, right? And he goes on to say that you must be born again because those who are born of the Spirit, you don't know where they come from. You don't know where they're going. It doesn't say those who are born of the water, you don't know where they're coming from and where they're going. No, we've already been born of that. And Nicodemus is like, how can this happen? Right? And what does Jesus tell him here? I have told you of earthly things, and ye believe not. How shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? What is the earthly thing that he told him? He told him being born of the water, of the flesh. That's your first birth. And that's an example of you being born again of the Spirit. Right? And then he tells him how to be born again. Right here. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You see? And he's talking about, he just told him about believing. I said, you believe when the Son of Man is lifted up, you have eternal life. He goes on. Everybody knows this one here. Let me, uh, this passage. Because it's all about belief. This is how you're born again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How? He gave his only begotten son because he's going to be raised up as the serpent is raised up. On Moses' staff. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son of god so we see here that if you believe you're not condemned he doesn't say if you're water baptized you're not condemned he says if you believe not on the name of the son of god then you're you're lost it's not hey you're not water baptized you're lost it's about believing and then after this this is what a catholic's going to do Oh, John, John the Baptist, baptizing over here. They came over here, they were baptizing after. Well, yeah, we have already read that after you believe, an outward show of your belief is baptism. This doesn't say that the baptism gives you the spirit, as we already read that baptism, I mean the spirit, is given to you when you believe. Because we can see as the thief on the cross... He was never water baptized. Yet, he was saved. Right? And uh, some Catholics will say, well, right, that's Old Testament where the thief is on the cross. Well, what in the Old Testament would save a thief uh, nailed to the cross? You see that it's kind of silly. They think they come up with some unanswerable argument and it's like okay he's a thief nailed on the cross he's basically old testament being stoned to death what saves him what old testament teaching and doctrine saves him i can't think of one what saves him is his faith in god his faith in jesus that he's the messiah that he's the savior of the world Never water baptized, never took a sacrament, never did any of that stuff. And that's the next thing Catholics twist is the sacrament. They say that the priest literally turns that wafer and the wine into the literal body and blood of Jesus. Which is weird because we're forbidden before the law to eat blood. During the law to eat blood and even after the law in the book of Acts forbidden to eat blood. This is metaphoric, and I want to show you, because Catholics will bring up John chapter 6, where Jesus fed 5,000 with a couple loaves and some fishes, or a couple fishes and some loaves, and these people wanted more bread. 
And Jesus says that I'm the bread of life. You see, what I was feeding you is an example of the manna given from heaven. It is the word of God. You need to live by every word of God, not by bread only. And they were like, what is he talking about? But Jesus, Jesus is the word of God. So then he ends up telling them to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And what does a Catholic do? We need to literally eat and drink Jesus. What is wrong with you? That What you're doing right there is this. That's insane. And, they were, and that, you know what a Catholic will say? That's why they left. That's why the people walked away and never followed with them again. Is that what happened? No. Read it for yourself. This is what happened. They were wondering, what is? how can we eat his flesh and drink his blood? Then Jesus says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. That's old English for bringing to life and energizing. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus is saying, my words, when you take my words, you hear them, you read them, and you believe them. It's as if you're eating bread. You're eating me, who is the bread of life. You're eating my flesh and you're drinking my blood. You're having communion with me because you're taking my word into you and you're believing it. I'm becoming one with you and you one with me because of our communion, not because you ate a wafer and you drank some wine. You're actually really having communion, which is communication through words. In Jesus' words, they are spirit and they are life. They are what bring to life and energize. Not bread, not some wine, but Jesus' words. He's using that as a metaphor because just as you can drink something and eat something and you can hold it in your mouth and be like, I don't like this and spit it out, that's like you don't believe it. You don't believe God's word, right? But when you take in God's word through your eyes, through your ears, you take it into your mind and you chew it up as if you were chewing up bread in your mouth or swishing around wine in your mouth. And if you choose to swallow it, you make that bread and wine one with you. Your body assimilates it. That's as if you believe Jesus' words. When you believe, that's when you're saved. You make his word part of you. You become one flesh with Jesus. One flesh with the word of God. And that's what saves you. But you see, what the problem was, was not that they weren't eating the this bread and wine that Jesus was giving out. Jesus was not giving out any bread or wine here, saying to eat of it. And they didn't dismiss eating some bread and wine that Jesus turned into his literal body and literal blood. That never happened. They were denying his words because he says, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, said I unto you that no man come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. This is when they left. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why? Because they came after him trying to get some literal bread. Because he fed the 5,000. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm going to give you my word. My word is what's going to give you life. This bread that you're going to eat, you're going to need more. You eat this bread, you're going to be hungry again. But my word you eat, you'll never hunger again. You'll never thirst. And they're like, yeah, let's get out of here. That's when they left. That's when the Catholic walks away and they go get some wafers and some wine. If you read it for yourself, you can see the Catholics jacked the shit out of this. Making it so you have to come to them, have to come to church, listen to their BS, or else you can't get the body and blood of Jesus. And now they can pump their BS into you and pressure you for some tithes. Uh, but look at what else that Peter says, you know, so that the supposed first pope, does he say, oh, you have... The flesh and blood of life. You have the bread of life. No. He says this. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. So it's all about the word of God. Not about some bread and some wine. And then the Catholic will bring up, well, at the Last Supper, Jesus says, this is my bread. 
that is broken for you, and this is this wine is my blood shed for you? Yeah, he's telling him that the Passover is pointing to his sacrifice. It's the Passover dinner, the Passover lamb. Is the lamb literally Jesus? It's the sacrifice of Passover is the lamb, the unspotted lamb. Jesus is the unspotted lamb. Is the do we did the priest go to the lamb and literally turn it into the body and blood of Jesus and then we partake of that? Is that what the Jews did? Is that what we should do? No, it's metaphoric. It's something like Jesus tells Nicodemus, I'm telling you of earthly things so that you can understand heavenly things. But if you can't grasp the earthly things, how are you going to understand the heavenly things? All right, continuing on here. Here's a big one because the Catholic Church is the the church that Christ built and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Even though Napoleon took out the Pope and the Pope now is saying that the Catholic Church in Islam worship the same God in his form in Islam, which is a church that's opening this year. I don't know if it's already opened or not. It's just joining Catholicism and Islam together. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, not to mention all the other crazy stuff coming from the Catholic Church, which would show that the gates of hell have prevailed. But because uh, the Catholic Church still exists, uh, I guess that means that the gates of hell haven't prevailed. But uh, anyway, let, let's take a look at this. Uh, English reading comprehension, right? This paragraph right here. In English, the first sentence of the paragraph is the topic and subject of the paragraph. So at verse 13, he says, When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So the topic of this paragraph is, Who is Jesus? Who is he? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah." Or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it to thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So this is the key. This is who Jesus is. This is the rock that the church is built upon. Peter's confession. And I'm going to show you because we're going to actually compare the scripture to the scripture and let the scriptures interpret itself because this is the only passage. The only passage in the Bible that you can twist like this to say that Peter is the rock and the foundation of the church. You can twist it to try to say Peter is. But you have no collaborating evidence in the Bible. You have one witness that you twisted. You need two or three to establish a fact. So let's we can say that, okay, Peter's the foundation as what we're going to read here, the rest of this. But we need collaborating witnesses. And we don't. We actually have Peter saying the exact opposite, which is something I'm going to get into when I'm done here. It says here at verse 18, And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whosoever thou shalt bind on earth, or whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth, shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charge the disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So we see here, again, the topic being talked about at the end, that Jesus is the Christ. This is the rock that is the foundation of the church, not Peter. And what we're going to do is actually go to the Strong's Concordance here to really show this. Because another thing you can do is this is also mentioned. Peter's Confession, John chapter 6, what we just read. No mention of Jesus telling Peter that he is the foundation of the church or getting the keys of heaven, right? You can do the same thing mentioned in Luke chapter 9, 18 through 20, Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 30. Neither one of those says Peter is the foundation. So we have one gospel 
that is twisted to say that Peter's the foundation. And why do they do that? Because they say the gates of hell will not prevail so that they can hide behind that. It's the same thing where Israel's saying that, you know, we're God's people. Nothing bad's ever going to happen to us. Look at Israel. What happened to them? So, yeah. Think about that. But anyway, let's go to the Greek here. Peter. Petros. Rock. Petra. He goes, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. He's not saying thou art a rock, and upon this rock I'm going to build my church. He's not saying thou art Peter, and upon Peter I'll build my church. He's saying you are Peter, you're a stone. Which in John, it actually says Peter's translated as a stone. And upon this rock, which is his confession of who he is, I will build my church. And want me to prove that? Let's look at what Peter says. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he refers to us, us as all as stones, just as he's a stone. Right? He says here, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also... It is contained in the scriptures, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Bunch of things Jesus uh, Peter says here. We're all a holy priesthood. Everybody who believes is a priest of God. Right? But they want to separate the priesthood from the, the laity, the average average people, so that you have to go to them and be under their thumb. Uh, next thing is, is that if you believe, you are obedient. Was on to you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but on to them which are disobedient. The opposite of believing is being unbelieving, disobedient, right? And then we go over to the Strong's Concordance here. And Jesus is called a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. He calls Jesus Petra. P Peter calls Jesus the rock Petra that the church is built upon. He doesn't call... Jesus Petros, he calls him Petra. So we can see that from Peter's own words that the rock, which we see through the whole Torah and Old Testament being referred to as God, is Jesus Christ that the church is built upon. Not Peter. Peter doesn't even say anything about being built upon him. He's, he's a stone like we are all lively stones built upon the chief cornerstone, Jesus. And then Paul backs us up because Paul doesn't say to build upon Peter. Paul doesn't say to build upon himself. What does he say here? In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, at verse 10, it says, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So we see here, Jesus is the foundation. Not Peter. And Paul doesn't even say to build upon Peter. He doesn't say to build upon himself. He says to build upon Jesus. Because look what he says next. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If a man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yes, so is by fire. So it says that we build upon Jesus. Jesus is our rock. He's the foundation. And if we have accepted Jesus as our foundation, we are saved because even if our works are shit, we're still saved. So it answers James' question, something I got into 
in the other video, breaking down James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, where can faith alone save you? Can a dead faith save you? Yes, these people build upon Jesus, they're saved, but their works are shit, so they're burned up. They lose their works, they don't get a reward, but they're still saved. You see, your, the reward for your works is not salvation. The reward for Jesus' works is salvation if we accept it by faith. And this is another thing Catholics will twist. They say this is purgatory. It's like, what? There's no mention of purgatory here. This says that your works, every man's work, will be in the fire. Not every man. Your work, whatever you've built up, is going to be tested by fire. You might lose your work. You might suffer the loss of your work. But himself shall be saved. It's not might be saved. You shall be saved because you're building on the foundation of Jesus. You're not building upon Peter. You're not building upon Paul. You're building upon Jesus. Right? Another thing. Catholics twist. All right? And that about sums it up. But since I have this here, I'll bring up this because what's most important is salvation. Right here. Here's something. I'll show you how Catholics twist this one. It says here, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we're saved by grace, which is the complete opposite of works. It's like grace is right and works are left. If you bring the left over to the right and the right over to the left, it becomes center. It's no more left or right. They have to be separate in order to be what they are. If you bring the left over to the right, over to grace, it's no longer left. It's no longer works. If you take the right, which is grace, and bring it over to the left, it's not right anymore. It's not grace. It's works now. It's over to the left. Right? So, how do you receive that grace, which is a gift of God? A gift is not something you can earn, and it's not something you got to do to keep it. It's a gift. You get it through faith. Faith is believing God and trusting Him. That's what faith is. Belief and trust. You believe in God's loving grace, that He came into this world, lived a perfect life, died for your sins, and rose again the third day. That's God's gift. You have belief in that. You have faith in that. That's what saves you. You're saved. This is present tense. Saved. Not being saved, will be saved. It is present tense. You've been saved because you believe it. And it goes on to make it clear, not of works, lest any man should boast. And what is a Catholic going to do? It doesn't say the exact phrase, faith alone. Well, it says through faith. There's nothing else with it. What's with the faith? It just says faith. If there's just faith, it doesn't, and it says no works whatsoever, nothing of yourselves, it's just faith. What else is there? Nothing. That's faith alone. How is the other way they twist it? Well, it's grace and faith. See, you're saved by grace through faith. Do you give yourself grace? No. The only thing coming from you is faith alone. God's supplying the grace. You're not supplying the grace. You're supplying the faith, which is believing and trusting God. Do you see how they twist that? Here's a third way they twist it. Next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Yeah, we should do good works. And they'll be like, see, you deny works. No, I don't. You should do good works. You should obey God, do good works, and you should get water baptized. You don't have to get water baptized. And even if your good works aren't perfect, and even if you don't really have many of them, or you don't have any of them all, guess what? You're still saved because you're saved by your faith in God's grace. You're not saved by these works. You see how they twist this? Catholic twist! It's going to be my new thing for these videos here. It's going to catch on. It's going to be awesome. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's a bunch of the things Catholics twist in the scriptures. You just got to take it for what it says. And it's pretty clear what it says. And since we, we talked about this one of faith, let's let's just do one more because I'm in the mood. 
Let's go to uh, this other one I've been talking with him about. Is uh, Romans chapter 4. This one where they twist. It says at uh, verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. But as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So if we take this for what it says, it says that Abraham were not justified by works. Abraham was accounted righteous because he believed God. If you are rewarded salvation by works, then it's not grace anymore. It's debted to you. But if you don't work and you just believe on God who justifies the ungodly, it's counted to you as righteousness. And David talks about the one who God imputeth righteousness without works. So what we see here if we use reading comprehension that a child can use, is that it's faith alone. And yes, faith is belief, belief and trust. So if somebody wants to say, they twist it and say, it's faith and belief. Well, those are intertwined and connected. And all we see here is faith. That's all we see. Where What's with the faith that saves you here? Grace? You don't get the grace. The only thing coming from you is the faith. We've already went over that. But a Catholic's going to twist that. They're going to do the twist and uh, come up with something. Uh, there's all kinds of crazy stuff that they come up with. Because it says works, not justified by works, right? And then Paul gives an example of a singular work, which is circumcision. So a Catholic will say, oh, this is talking about circumcision, the work of circumcision. Okay. Let's say that's what it's talking about. It doesn't say, oh, you don't need to get circumcised. You need to get water baptized. Oh, you don't need to do the work of circumcision. You need to do the work of water baptism. It doesn't say that. It says, no, no, no. You're not justified by works. You're justified by your faith. Right? Which contradicts what James says, you know, because the Catholics will bring up James, but I already brought that up in detail in the other video. So I'm just going to briefly go over where James says that you're not justified by, uh, you're justified by works and not by faith only. That doesn't mean you're not justified by faith alone. It's saying that faith alone justifies you, but works do as well. James is saying that both do. And I got into that in more detail in the other video. So if Abraham just had the works, he would not be justified before God. Right? But if you just have faith, you're justified. You see how that works? Because if you got faith and works, right? But let's say you just have faith, you're justified. If you just have works, you're not justified. If you have faith and works, you're justified because you're justified by the faith. It's not the works. It's best if you have faith and works, but what justifies you and saves you is the faith, not the works. Because if you don't have the faith, the works will do nothing. Nothing at all. So we see here, it says just faith. Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness. Said he believed. It didn't say anything else but believed. It says, you know, it's grace, so it's not about your work. And it says, to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith just faith alone, there's nothing with that, is counted for righteousness. And David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Right? We see faith alone here. Oh, but the Catholic, it doesn't say faith alone in that exact phrase. Twist! Twist! That's what that is. That's a twisting of scriptures. This is destroying God's word 
It doesn't mean what it says. It doesn't say what it means. I'm going to tell you what it really means. In other words, they're saying that they themselves are God. The early church fathers are God. The church is God. They are the inspired ones. They are the ones that are going to tell you God's word. They are the ones that uh, dictate the truth and they are the authority of the truth. Which is something else Catholics will say is that the church is the pillar of the truth. It doesn't say the Catholic church. The church is those who believe. And the pillar of truth is not the truth. The pillar of truth holds up the truth. It's not that it is the truth. Something that needs to be said. A pillar holds something up. And the truth, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. The Bible is the truth. The Bible is what the church holds up. The Catholic Church doesn't do that. Catholic Church twists. They basically, for the longest time, the Catholic Church kept people illiterate and kept the Bible from people. And then when people started getting the Bible and it was translated into their languages, they started burning the Bibles, burning the people who would translate them and torture those who read it and believed it. Now they don't have the power to do that. So what can they do? Well, they got a twist. They got no choice. They don't want this here, but they can't burn it and they can't get rid of the people who believe it. So they got to just mangle this thing. That's all they can do. So, uh, yeah, that's that. Thanks for watching and take care. Hope you enjoyed episode one. We'll see what happens in the next episode. Thanks for watching and take care.